Welcome to The Entrepreneur Next Door, and it's my pleasure to welcome Brendan Kumarasamy to the podcast. Brendan, welcome. Thank you for saying yes and agreeing to be a guest. Um, please take a minute to introduce yourself. Zev, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thanks for having me on the show. So yeah, my name is Brendan Kumarasamy. I'm the founder of Master Talk. Master Talk is a YouTube channel I started to help the world master the art of communication, public speaking. I also have a coaching practice where I train a lot of executives and CEOs on how to be better speakers. And how I got started was when I was in college, I went to business school, studied the opposite. All of right, you, so wait. Oh, oh you want to jump here? I want to stop you because you I want to have nothing left to ask you when you dive right in. So <laughs> no, that's good. That's all good. So um, I'm, go I'm going to, I'm going to, spin around because that was going to be my first question so go ahead your your work history includes some very impressive companies ibm pwc was price waterhouse pretty pretty well known um you worked for a college when was the point in your career where this thing hit you and you said i want to be a speaking coach for sure, Zev. And it was absolutely random. So to your point, when I went to business school, I did the opposite of what you'd expect me to do as a speaking coach, which is I wanted to become an accountant. That was actually my dream since I was 12, because it was the most secure way I saw myself alleviating my family out of poverty, because I was good at mathematics. That was the rationale. So I went to school, studied accounting, and somebody told me in my first semester of college, since you know my background pretty well, about the big four accounting firms, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, Ernest & Young, KPMG. Never heard of these companies before. I went to an information session for PwC when I was 19 years old in sweatpants. That's how lost I was because my parents were factory workers. I didn't know any better. I get there and I'm thinking to myself, is PricewaterhouseCoopers like a water bottling company? That's how lost I was. And then I learned later that these are the, some of the most coveted jobs in the industry. If you get one of them, you're pretty much secure for life if you work there long enough. So that became my mission. So the next part of this, so I'm still not at master talk yet or speech coaching, how to get a job at Price or Deloitte. So I go to these cocktails, I meet students who are older than me, and they told me two things, Seth. case competitions. If you do case competitions, you'll be successful. And I didn't know what they were. And they later told me it's like communication competitions. You do well at these presentations, you get a job. So I did them. And that's how I learned the skill set accidentally with communication coaching and ended up starting Master Talk. So, so two questions. One, you mentioned uh, my parents were factory workers. My mission was to get my family out of poverty. Was that here or was that somewhere else? I mean, here, are you Canadian, right? That's correct. Yes. So my parents immigrated from Sri Lanka in the early 90s. And then when we got here to Canada, I was born in Canada, to your point. And then what happened is because they didn't really have an education. I'm the first person to have a degree, a university degree in my family. So before me, the prior generation, my mom and dad worked at factories on minimum wage to, to pay for, for us and to, to, to give us a life here. So, so you were lucky in the, in the DNA shuffle. You got a whole bunch of good genes for math and and numbers, which is impressive. So let's talk about this this case stuff that you somehow found your way into. What was that about? What what is that case competition? For sure, Zev. I love the deeper questions. So here's what a case competition is, because you're right, not a lot of people know what that is. So a lot of people equated to debate, but it's not really about debate. It's a recruitment tool for the best companies to recruit people in, in, from universities. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we're Amazon. Amazon comes up to us and says, I want to open more retail locations in the country, but I don't know where I should put the next store. Should I put it in Florida, maybe in Fort Lauderdale, or should I put it in New York City? So then what the student must do or a group of students is they're given a 20 page document Zev. they have to read the entire document come up with a bunch of slides figure out a solution to the case and then at the end of those th that three hour period they have to go to the judges who are often executives of the company and pitch their solution 
and the best solution wins the case. That's how these things are structured. So Amazon will pay the school or the association ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars just to do a case about their company to see who's good. And then based on who's really talented, they give them job offers. So when I was in school, the reason I saw it as my ticket out of poverty, because I didn't know, I didn't have a dad who worked at PwC, I didn't have a, a mom who worked at a big company, is if I could get better at communication, nothing to do with master talk, I could get my fifty thousand dollar a year job and change my family's history. So that's why I saw it. So I'd go there and I'd do really well at these competitions. And that's how I got the judges to uh, eventually give me a job at one of these institutions. So what were the qualifications that the students were required to have? I mean, you can't just grab a, you know, a literature major student and say, go do this, right? You're right, Zav. So, so case competitions are only open to business students. Okay. That's why the community is so small. So to your point, you know, the executive at Amazon doesn't really want to hire somebody in, in literature. I mean, there could be exceptions, obviously. But it's similar to hackathons in computer science or moot court in law school, where some of the law firms in, in, in law or uh, technology companies like Facebook or Google, they'll invest money into these hackathons to just to see who's really good because if you're doing this for fun outside of school you're probably really talented you're somebody we want so to your point they would bring business students but the business students weren't savvy because remember a lot of these students were 19 20 21 years old but that's who the big four want because those people do all the grunt work to keep the pyramid so obviously, let's say in a, in a service-based company like a PricewaterhouseCoopers, the, the employees who are at the bottom of the pyramid, the margins are really high for them because they do a lot of the easy work and they can charge the client at higher rates. So they want those people. And they're aggressively recruiting the best talent. So the four are already com always competing against each other for the best students. So they do these case competitions to recruit them before everyone else does. So, so you're a business major and what? You were going for accounting at the time or finance? That's, that's correct. And I graduated in it as well. So, so you go into this case, case competition and you know, what's, you know what the grand prize is, right? They pick the winners and then you, I guess, some would guarantee the job. Is that, that's it, right? You, yeah, exactly. And you don't always need to, because I love the nuance of this conversation, so I'll give you all the nuance. You don't necessarily need to win the competition as long as you're impressing the judges. So if you're really good, but you get second or third place, I mean, the big four are hiring, as you know, they're big firms, they're hiring a lot of people. So in, in other words, what I'm trying to say, literally everybody who does case competitions, Zev, because a small community, let's say in my school, we had the world's largest one, which is 80 students, but there's 8,000 students in the business faculty. So it's 1% of the faculty. So all of my friends went to Goldman Sachs, they went to McKinsey, they went to BCG, they went to Deloitte or Price. We all got great job jobs out of it because the community is so small. So, so you're up against some smart people. Everybody knows what's at the, I mean, at least in the US when you graduate college and I know one of my best friends, friend's son got that, he went to Goldman Sachs starting salaries 150k yep out of college so it's it's fiercely competitive because because you know you scratch the the lotto ticket this is what's going to happen at the end how do you prepare for it i mean you, you're a smart guy i mean you go in there it's not just about doing the work in reading the document and coming up with some really good uh way to analyze it and present a solution but you're up against other people how do you prepare for it? And that's, it's exactly that point. What a keen observation on your point, Zev, that allowed me to shortcut 40 years of communication knowledge. So I'm sure one of the thoughts in your mind is like, how in the world is a 26 year old coaching all of these CEOs and executives? How does that even make any sense? And the short answer to that, which hints at that point, is that I compressed 40 years of knowledge into four. So you're right. These case competitions were ferocious. These are the best students from every business faculty across the world. And I'm insanely competitive. Think of me like the Michael Jordan that nobody really cares about because it's case competitions. Like nobody cares. About. But to that specific community, I, I initially started doing these competitions to get a job. 
but I fell in love with them. I grew an obsession to winning them. And that's what ultimately led me into then coaching the students the following year. So just to give you the all whole timeline, mm-hmm. 19, I start university. I find out what these case competitions are and what the big four accounting firms are. So I spend the whole year preparing to try out for the competition program because you're up against 300 people around and they pick the top 70. So it's around a 25% acceptance rate. So I work for a year just to get into the program. Then I get into the program, let's say 19 and a half, 20 years old. And then I start winning these competitions by be- And the reason I started winning was because I really worked on my communication skills so that I'd win. So it wasn't to get a job. I just wanted to win the competition because I just grew an obsession to it. There's a lot of components that go into this, but I'll give you the simplest one, which is the speech introduction. So let's say we're presenting to the board of executives of Walmart. So remember, these are all 20-year-old kids. So most people who are doing case competitions, when they show up in front of these VPs, they're nervous. So they show up and they go, um, hi, uh, Zev. Uh, my name's Brendan, and today we're talking to the board of Walmart, and this is the future. So they're still great. I mean, just the fact that they're competing is already a big deal. But that's not how we roll, right, at our school. So when we jump in, we're all clean suits. We jump in, we shake everybody's hands. We're 20 years old. And then we look at the board of executives, and our introduction sounds something more like this. Ever since I was a kid, I always loved going to Walmart, the groceries, the electronics. It always felt like Disneyland every time I walked into one of these stores. And Walmart, your founder and your organization has revolutionized the way that we think about retail. And that's exactly why in today's presentation, we're going to be showing you the future of your organization, some strategies to consider. Good afternoon to the board of directors of Walmart. You get the idea. So it's really professional. So these VP would look at us and go, this kid speaks better than my executives at the company. So they would hand out these job offers like butter, but it wasn't about the job anymore, Zeph. It was about winning. And I had an insane obsession with that, which then later turned into me helping other students in the program get really good at speaking. So so where is that that winning drive come from? I mean, you're you're still just a kid, right? You're 20, 21, 22. (laughs) You, you pick up, you decide, okay, I'm going to look better and sound better than other people. Fine, but where does that winning drive come from? It comes from a hatred towards my father. You know, my, my tens were really focused on proving other people wrong. A lot of my success back then was driven by survival and anger. So a lot of it was, you know, my dad's an alcoholic or was at the time. He passed away in 2019. But when I was struggling in, let's say, my mid-tens, she, my mom was pretty much a single mother. Even if my dad was in the in the picture, he never left. He was always in the home. But I stopped talking to him after I was 15 years old because he caused so much stress in my life and he was pretty much the only negative person in it. And that drove me to win because he always told me that I could never be successful in life. And that always pushed me to be better. That's one reason. The other reason is I didn't want my mom to suffer. So from the ages of 12 to 22, I wasn't thinking about the world. I didn't become an accountant because I wanted to save the world, that I wanted to, you know, oh, because I have a passion for numbers. No, I wanted to make money. That was my focus. I didn't grow up with a lot. So I knew that if I just made $70,000 a year, $100,000 a year, I could fix all of the problems that my family struggled with for generations and I became that person. So that's what drove me to become successful and it worked, but I had to find so, a different reason later in life. So interesting. Cause I think, you know, one of my previous guests, Joe Applebaum. Absolutely. I, I, I know Joe's like a master networker, brilliant guy. Uh, I saw that he commented in one of your posts, which I mean, I, I don't know how he does what he does every single day because he's like the busiest pen, man in the universe. But in in our conversation, he revealed that when he was nine years old, his father told him he was stupid, right? I mean, what, what a thing to hear from your dad, right? The, your role model. And that was the driving force behind him pr- trying to prove, and he did, that he wasn't stupid. So I, I think I, I find it interesting that that kids that go through that type of a childhood with that type of a, of abuse go into one or two ways. 
they either go nowhere and they spend their life feeling like a victim and always blame their past, or they do what happened to you and they say, God damn it, no, I'm not that. I'm going to prove myself and I don't need that. And and you did. Joe did. You did. Pretty interesting. Um, so I get where the drive comes from. Um, but, you know, I've... I've interviewed a lot of people in my career, and there's some people who are really good at interviewing. And once in a while, you know, I, I made the wrong decision. They're really good at interviewing, and then they show up, and the closets come out of, you know, the stuff comes out of the skeletons come out of the closet. And they were great speakers, but they had nothing behind them, mm. right? They were an empty suit, as sometimes we call it. It was, they, they know how to play the game, but there was nothing behind it. So how did you how did you overcome this? Because these these execs sitting there watching you, your brilliant minds come in there and nail the presentation, speak right to them and maintain eye contact and shake their hands and exude confidence and you speak well and the analytics that you use to present them with a the solution were probably brilliant. What else do they look for other than that? Great question, Zeb. So let's start with the, there's a couple of points there. It's a fascinating question. The first piece is a lot of the people that were coaching me, because I had a big ego when I was 19, like any other kid do. And honestly, I still have it. It's just a lot smaller because it got beaten out of me in my 20s. So I matured quickly. But when I was 19, I had an ego the size of New York City because I was the person who was winning these competitions. I got into this program. And I wanted to show everyone how great I was. My coaches, on the other hand, thought the opposite. A lot of them were senior executives who were part of the program 10 years ago. So think of it like a holistic cycle, Zeb. So mm -hmm. they enter the program. They're the most brilliant people in the faculty. They'll get the job at the Goldman Sachs. They'll get the job at the McKinsey's. They'll rise to fame really quickly in the corporate ladder because they're just 10 times more talented than the average business school student that comes out of the university. So they'll become VPs long before they're 30. And then what happens is 10 years later, five years later, they come back to give back to the program. So a lot of the people who coach me are alumni. So some of them are C-level executives, they're VPs, and they, they ran my book pretty quick. Let's put it that way. Like the first couple of times I give a presentation, they would look at me and say, did I really waste time? I could have dinner with my family and spend time with you. This is horrible. That's the type of feedback I would get. That's one piece. The other pieces were the judges. The judges were a lot more easygoing th than you would think as executives. And the reason is really simple. They built up our confidence because they know we're 20 years old. They're not expecting a $10 million strategy off of three hours of work. They just want to see how much effort are you putting into the presentation. So a lot of my first judges who, that I'd won competitions from and built relationships with were VPs at large Canadian banks. They were presidents at some institutions, but they would never talk to me like I was missing 20 things. It it was more like, oh, wow, this kid's pretty good for his age. Let's give him a chance. Let's build him up. Let's develop him into the person that he wants to be. And that base, that foundation really helped me when I entered the real business world where the market is the market. So that foundation and that, that not client base, but just a friendship helped me in understanding the language of the C-suite. So even when I was 20 years or 30 years younger to from a lot of my clients today, I was able to talk to them at that level, but I owe a lot of that success to the people who really invested in me when I was younger. So it, it really fascinating. And 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 I'll be honest, although I don't like to even start a sentence that, that says I'll be honest, because it's I don't know any other way. So when I when I kind of prepared for this, and I think the first time I ran into you, and that's why I reached out, I was incredibly impressed with your delivery and your your charisma because that's really the key that that's a word that nobody's using anymore you know but charisma does mean something and then i flip a switch in my head and i say okay let let me be a potential client of brandon and I'm, i see this young guy on the stage he's clearly entertaining he's got it together he he hits he hits points really powerfully i'm talking about speaking and coaching but he's a young kid. How much can he possibly know, right? 
Absolutely. Don't you face, I mean, so so I want to get back to this question because to ask you, how do you overcome that? But then you go to this corporate thing, you, you do your job, and at some point you wind up in the basement deciding that this is, I don't want to do the corporate thing. I want to do, I want to be a, a, a speaking coach. Why? Right. So this is an accident. That, that's what I would start with. I was never meant to be a business owner because I was allergic to entrepreneurship. I believe there's two types of entrepreneurs since we're the entrepreneur next door, right? So the first type of entrepreneur is the born one. So Gary Vaynerchuk is a great example of a born entrepreneur. Mark Cuban is a, another great example. Where they don't do anything but business. That's what they're meant to do. They're selling lemonade when they're six years old. They're doing a, you know, candy trafficking in high schools. Like that's what they're meant to do. And then the second type of entrepreneur is what I would argue I'm more relevant to, which is the made entrepreneur. Someone who doesn't really want to be a business owner isn't looking to become one but for some reason in the in the destiny that life has in store for them they make a decision to become one because i was looking to be an executive at ibm i i later switched careers kind of to, to skip the boring part of the story here i switched from accounting to technology consulting because these case competitions were giving me a lot better job opportunity than just working at an accounting firm so my starting salary was much higher working as a consultant and i had much and it was more interesting work so i switched careers so i just wanted to be an executive at ibm so what happened in my last semester of college at this point i was 22 years old i had won probably 10 or 15 case competitions, and I had lost another 30, 35. And I'd coached probably 60 people on an individual level on how to communicate ideas effectively, just as a friend. So I never made a single dollar off coaching, didn't know it was a business. My last semester, somebody came up to me and said the, the game-winning question, which changed the course of my life, which was simply, how did you learn how to speak? Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, Zev, and I said, what do you mean? They said, well, did you hire a coach? Did you do Toastmasters? Like, how did you learn how to speak? And I didn't have an answer. I was just self-taught minus the coaches that had helped me in cases. They said, didn't you watch YouTube videos? And that's what sparked the idea. So at this point, I had like that literally a month before that question, my dream was finished. I'm done. I got, I got the job I worked so desperately to get. IBM, huge starting salary. Life's going to change. And it did. I worked there for two and a half years. But... I started watching YouTube videos, and then I realized that all of the communication experts who had PhDs in the field, I, I fundamentally disagreed with everything that they were sharing. There were so many holes in their thought process. Like one, the solutions weren't practical. It wasn't working directly on clients. The second piece was all of it was theory-based. And the third one, which is the most obvious step, if you're a communication coach, you better be a great communicator. And all of them were talking like this on video. So I just got really pissed off and I started making videos. And that's how my entrepreneurship journey started. Yeah, it, it's, it, it really goes down to the, I guess, the, 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 the primal brain that we all have, where we feel that if somebody has a PhD at the end of their name, uh, or they do something at a very high level, high concepts, that especially academia, right? And all, oh, he's a professor, he knows. But in reality, those that are, and again, I'm not disrespecting full-time professors. I was one for six years of graduate school of business in New York, but as a, I hated the word adjunct professor. Uh, I, I think those that, that choose a career of, of academia, uh, are smart people and they have a role in, in life, but they lack the practical, you know, what I call in the trenches experience. So I feel the same way about marketing people, the way you just did. You know, there's gazillion people on the universe who sell marketing stuff uh, from the wannabe experts, guru, evangelists, all the other crappy adjectives they attach with themselves, who, who all, st everybody's stories was the same, right? Oh, I dropped out of college. I lived in my car. I ate from the garbage. And then all of a sudden... <laughs> Boom, I learned how to use YouTube and you too can have six figures. Here's my check. See that? Uh, so people have a tendency to just get excited over those kind of people. And I guess you had the intuitive sense to see that what they're talking about may be correct. But you said the key word, I think for me, it was, it was theory. 
And the average person isn't going to take a 300-page manuscript about speaking, going to read it, and then implement what happens to it, right? It's just not going to happen. No one's going to do it. So we're all lazy. We go to YouTube. But if that same guy that wrote the book is on YouTube to promote his book, and he's boring, but he's giving you the psychological techniques of how to connect with people, that's just insanely stupid. But people just go for it. And I look, my theory is, and I'm as guilty as it is everybody else, that, and, and I want to get to some of the practical aspects of what you do, is that we'll watch a YouTube, and maybe it'll be exciting, and you get a whole bunch of ideas, and then it, it's over, and you turn it off, and you do feel energetic and excited, and then the phone rings, and off you go, right? Nothing ever happens to it. And, you know, my my accountant, who became also as my client, signed up for Tony Robbins and went and spent ridiculous amount of money to do his three-day thing where at the end you walk on calls. Uh, it's it's impressive. And I like Tony Robbins. I thought he was a fake when he came out, but I think he's he's got some really good stuff. And he came back from spending 10 grand, 8 grand or whatever it was. And, and, I, and I was coaching him and I said, you didn't learn anything, did you? <laughs> Right, you just went to Tony Robbins and you told everybody you went to Tony Robbins and you walked on calls at the end, but what'd you get out of it other than you did it, right? Um, so we know that. Look, we we agree, and you you're you're the guy with the knowledge that obviously speaking is critical, but it's more critical because. Uh, as a marketing guy, we're all on camera these days, right? Everybody wants to do YouTube because YouTube is the, the the new thing, right? You got to get on camera. It's engaging. It's the most engaging medium in any marketing platform. So it's so it's critical. Your point is, speaking is about storytelling, right? You have to be a storyteller, and and I 100% agree with you. Because if you don't tell a story, you're boring. If you're boring. No one's going to pay attention to you. Um, what's the bi biggest challenge that that you find with people that want to speak? And maybe they understand that they need to tell a story, but they just don't get it. They just don't have it. How do For you make sure. the transformation with them? Absolutely, Zev. So here's my perspective on this, because every, every communication professional is going to give you a different answer, which I also think is really fascinating about this industry. So, so the way I think about it is communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time. So one of those balls is eye contact, one of those balls is smiling, one of them is body language, facial expression, storytelling, and the list goes on. But notice how I list all of these off. It feels really overwhelming because it is. If you try and do all 18 at the same time, all of the balls will naturally fall to the floor. So for me, the question has always been, what are the three easiest balls that we can juggle to build our momentum up in communication? And I've always argued that storytelling is ball 15. And the reason is really simple. If you don't have the foundations and you tell the best story in the world, no one's going to listen to it. Example, I remember growing up as a kid, my mother always used to tell me, notice how if you don't have the vocals, if you don't have the pacing, if you don't have the less filler words, no ums and ahs, you can't get to that point. So for me, it starts with my easy threes. And then I'm happy to comment on storytelling specifically, if you'd like me to, Zev, which starts with ball number one. What is the easiest thing that we can do today to get us results? It's that practicality that I felt was missing from the PhDs and that prompted me to start this whole thing four years ago, which is the random word exercise. Pick a random word like phone, like iPhone, like light bulb, like ceiling, and create random presentations on the spot. And this serves two purposes. Though. The first one is it helps us deal with uncertainty because life is filled with it. Like when you meet somebody new at a restaurant or at a coffee shop, you don't know what that dialogue is going to sound like. So when you're dealing with words like avocado and you go back to regular conversation or presentations that you're generally an expert in, those presentations become a joke. And then the other piece to the random word exercise is if we can make sense out of nonsense, we can make sense out of anything. And that's the magic of doing this with your kids, doing this in the shower, doing this in general to build in the reps. Yeah, pretty cool. And and I watched that random word presentation he had and 
Uh, I have a word for you. I'm going to hit you with later, just to just to to do this. Sure. Um, so let's talk about um, the 520 rule, because you've and you, you've managed to accomplish again. For, when I watch YouTube, and maybe it's the way I'm wired because I'm a marketing guy. When when I type in a, a subject, and the results come out. I will completely ignore anybody that had three, four, five thousand views. I immediately go to the person that had the most amount of views, maybe because I'm biased and I'm saying, okay, this guy has that many views because he's managed to build credibility, right? And and a following that people that, are, that respect and appreciate and learn from that person. Is that is that wrong? I definitely don't think that's wrong, Sav. I, I think that's I'm, just... I'm, I'm setting you up because you didn't start that way, right? On your first video, you recorded on your phone and you posted it. I don't know what you had. What did you have? Three views or no views, right? Zero. And then, so how do you go from there, right? Where do you get the motivation to keep going? Right. How do you bridge the balance? How, how do you bridge both perspectives? So, so the answer is really simple. The biggest mistake most people make on YouTube, and I would argue anything to do with personal branding, just who they're they are who, and the video the content they're trying to create is they think in days not decades which is funny for somebody in their 20s to tell somebody who's older than they are who's listening to the show probably because i'm guessing 90 percent of your audience is probably older than i am right it's funny for me to say that but it's true most of us as human beings we don't think decades out we think days out that's why we get the results that come with it is we think about what's hot right now you know tiktok's really hot right now linkedin organic's really hot right now. well guess what in three years tiktok's gone probably or maybe it isn't but there's no guarantee that a single platform except maybe YouTube, is going to last for a long time, which automatically implies the day-to-day -day does not matter as much as who you want to be in 10 years, which brings us to the 520 rule. So what was my perspective when I started the channel at 22? I told myself, probably a few months into it, that at the end of the day, if I post one high-quality piece of content that's well-produced every single week for the next 10 years, it is unreasonable for me to be unsuccessful. It's unreasonable because if I have one video and it's all amazing and I have 520 videos at the end of my 10 year cycle, no one's going to be that consistent. And it was obvious to me when analyzing the other channels in my niche who had 300,000 subscribers, 500,000 subscribers that slowly became my colleagues as well as, as my YouTube channel developed, they're always missing weeks. So I was like, if I just stay consistent, I'll win. That's, that's the other piece. But there's a third piece to that, which is a mindset that I believe I'm the only person that has in this industry, which is really odd. It's not about 10,000 followers. It's about 10,000 conversations. My mindset from day one, Zev, was, you know what? If YouTube never promotes my videos or never does anything to me, then I'll go on 10,000 podcasts. Because if I go on 10,000 podcasts and Zev is the only person listening to me, at least I would make a new friend and that friend would share my YouTube videos with three to five of their buddies if they were just as impressed. That's why I always pushed my expertise because I knew eventually I would win in the market. It just took a lot less longer than 10 years. Re really interesting because um, my last guest, his name is Chris Joyce, and um I had a follow-up conversation a couple of days ago, and I'm bringing him back because it's fascinating. He was jumping up and down when we were speaking, and he said, never build your future on someone else's platform. Mm -hmm. And his message was sort of like the, what you're saying, right? Um, if you're going to go on Amazon, if you're going to go on YouTube, if you're going to go on TikTok, and you know, all these things, these are not your platform. And so you're swimming with sharks. You're inside the bell curve, duking it out with everybody else, trying to get some attention from some random guy somewhere in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, and and I agree from a marketing perspective, I, I agree not to dismiss the power of the platforms, but if you truly want to grow, yeah, you grow through maybe one connection at a time that leads to a referral to three people. But, but posting at the, the 520, the 52 weeks times 10, right? You still have to promote it, though. It, it's not, you're not going to be found randomly, right? So what'd you do? 
That's correct. So half of the time is producing great content. The other half, as a general rule of thumb, is distributing that content. So I'll tell you exactly how I got my first thousand subscribers. I don't hide it. It's very obvious. And I did not buy followers. What I did is I DM'd everybody I knew in my network. So I'd built a really big network for myself at that time because I was so involved in university. I'd probably had 2,000 connections on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. probably 1,500 on Facebook. And I got 1,000 subscribers in only three months. The reason is very simple. Because all of those 60, 70 people I'd coached, I genuinely did this out of the goodness of my heart and because I wanted to win those competitions, right? So it was selfish in that way. But definitely not from a money perspective because I didn't know you could even make money until I met my business coach and then he kind of set me up for what I do today. But at the beginning, it was really – Hey, like I'm just helping people out. I don't really know how to coach people on communication. It's just something I felt was missing in the program. When I became an executive, an executive quote unquote, in the student run competition program that I was like, this is missing. Let me just coach these 20 students on how to speak. I'll just take it on myself, even if I had no idea what I was doing. But guess what? When you, when you give to other people, as I'm sure you've learned in your life, Zev, a lot better than I have. Karma always comes back around. So I went to those 60, 70, 80, 200 people that I'd gotten jobs at all these prestigious companies. I had never asked for anything back. And I said, this is what you're going to do for me. You're going to promote. I'm not going to swear too much on the show. So you're going to promote like crazy my, my channel to everybody that you know. Even when the channel was terrible and it was still in my mom's basement, the tips were still good. The content was excellent, but everything else around the content was garbage, for lack of a better term. But they still promoted it because they knew me. That's the key to, to winning in content creation. People aren't willing to do the at-bats. And that's mm -hmm. why winning locally in your market is actually the most important piece because they know you. And that's how I got to 1,000. After a thousand subscribers, things get a lot easier on YouTube, especially when I started producing it professionally nine months into it. So you, you mentioned before that the one of the things you did was deliver quality content, right? Or produce it. How do you define quality content? Fantastic question. So here's the way I think about it, Zev. For me, it always comes down to what is the definition of value? And Chris Doe from the future, I think, has the best definition, which is tell me something I don't already know. Mm -hmm. So I felt the reason I had legs in this industry, even if I was, I'm probably 20 years younger than the average successful communication coach, because most coaches are broke, let's face it. So for me, it was, it was we both know it, but, but the point is, and I was too until recently, but the idea now becomes, what do I know about the industry from the, from the tips that I'm leading with that other people don't know? So it's a framework I teach called QIT, which stands simply for questions, insights, and thoughts, right, or titles. So essentially what I did when I got started is I did the thing that most content creators, especially in, in the educational space, just don't do, which is talk to the person that you want to serve. So I had three, four-hour dinners with my initial audience were my case competition students, the 70, 80 people. That was my first audience for Master Talk, and they wanted to hear from me. I was solving a problem. When I was telling everyone the idea for Master Talk, they all supported me. I didn't need executives to buy into me at the time. It was those 80 people who said, yeah, 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 let me give you ideas. So you would sit down and they would ask me questions. That's Q. I'll give you an example. Hey, Brendan, I'm really struggling presenting in English because English is my second language. I don't know what to do. And I could relate to that because I speak three languages. So I sat down going to I, which is insights, and I booked out 90 minutes of my schedule. And I would just sit there with the Word documents, Zev, and I would go, what's my perfect answer to this question right now? And I would think about it. I would ponder it. Okay, this is how I coach. So step one would be probably write in your first language. That's what you're comfortable in. Step two, translate it into English. Step three, do a vocabulary test. Just present that to native speakers and they'll fix your grammar. That sounds really obvious, but nobody was nobody had a video on that until me. So then T just became how do you title the video? Take the question, use YouTube SEO, turn into how do you present, how to present in a second language. But the point here, going back to your question, Zeb, how do we create quality content? 
So the, the main theme is create information to questions that your audience is asking you, but answer the question in unique ways that you feel the industry hasn't answered yet. And the way that you do that, which takes time, is you got to sit down and listen to what everyone else is saying. So I just listened to communication coaches and I was like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And my videos just fixed those disagreements I had with them. So because I'm a marketing guy and I think the marketing is the is, is literally the bloodline or the lifeblood of of any business, um, it really go, it comes back to the question that I ask everybody I work with, and I'm part of an international mentoring platform called Growth Mentor, uh, and I I coach people from around the world. Literally, I start my day every day. And it's been one of the most fascinating experiences for me personally. And many of them are founders of SaaS companies. Others are, you know, they're startup mode. Some of them are more mature. And I always start the first question. My first question is always, what problem are you solving? And eight out of 10 can't answer the question. They just don't get it. They start telling me about the features of their platform. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. Okay, I believe you, fine. What problem are you solving? And and I'm I'm bringing this up based on after what you just said, you know, the QIT stuff is that at least from my perspective, if you're going to go up and speak or you're going to produce any type of content, you're producing it for an audience. Now, one can argue that your audience could be, I, I don't know if you have specific demographics that you're pitching to, but generally speaking, you could say in your in your case, anyone who's a professional who wants to be a better presenter. I don't know if that's that's your mode, which is a pretty wide swath of the universe, right? But the, the question still applies, right? What problem are you solving, Brandon? Right, Sav. And to be honest, when I started the business, I had no idea because I was just making videos. I didn't know it was a business. So let me go through the, the timeline here. So nine months into Master Talk, this is September 2019. At that point, I met my business partner, Vamsi Poli Metlo, the CEO and founder of Make More Leaders. And to my credit, and no, sorry, to his credit and to my luck, he wanted to partner with me. And he started coaching me pretty much for free, believed in me. He started coaching me, uh, sorry, referring the first clients that I got. When I looked at him and said, who would pay me thousands of dollars? I literally laughed at him. I was like, come on, dude, like, let me just stay at IBM. I'll have a good life. And he's the one who presented the first problem set, which was brown technology professionals living in the United States were stuck in middle management. That became my first customer segment. Okay. Why is that? Because a lot of them, they're not currently my customers anymore as much, and we could talk about why that is later. But essentially what happened was that specific community have trouble getting to VP because they grew up doing technical work. So software development, kind of SaaS. I mean, you know the space actually yeah. very well. And, and then what happens is they become architects or developers or managers and they get stuck because they don't have the communication skills and the leadership skills to realize that, wait a second, 90% of your job isn't coding anymore. It's managing people. But the trick is I'm the only person or one of the few people who could actually solve that problem for them because they trust me because I'm brown. That's why I mentioned brown technology professionals. Yeah. So that became my first customer base. I was helping them with removing their ums and ahs, speaking with more conviction in the boardroom, removing their insecurities whenever they talked to the steering committee. But I hated my life. And the reason I hated my life, not with all of them, but with a, I, I always like being real on podcasts, but with the ma majority of them, they had always shortcut my price, even if they were making three, 500K a year. Like a lot of them were very, like doing really well off the options. They'd be like three thousand dollars for a package. Oh my god! Like I could go, I could book two flights to India. They would always shortcut my price. They would never appreciate the work that I do, and it was they wouldn't refer anyone because their community wasn't investing in their growth. So I was stuck, and I knew I could dominate that niche through like a LinkedIn outbound strategy that I kind of refined over the years. But I was I just wasn't happy, Zev. And then I figured out who my core client base is, which I'll get into. But I think the key point, the message for everyone, is everyone tells you to niche down. I actually disagree with that advice because I think it's too simplistic. I think the real advice is you need to kind of like with marketing, and feel free to correct me since you're obviously the expert, not me, is you got to just split test a bunch of different things. 
You got to split test the different customer segments. You got to split test the different acquisition strategies and then sort your cost per acquisition per distribution channel to see what's actually working. And then you just triple down on what's working. And it took me years to differentiate growing the audience, which is a completely different skill set versus how do I actually make money so I don't starve or my family doesn't starve? Completely different. And now where I've landed on and I found a lot more success is if they're brown technology professionals, they have to be VP at minimum or else I don't work with them unless they're really pushing me to work with them, which is like 5% of the time. But primarily my clients that I adore are women executives in corporate. They're the best. They talk about their coaches a lot more. They're super open about processing their emotions and learning. Men never talk about their coaches. I never get any referrals, very little, yeah. right? Because they're insecure. And then the third piece is they don't even have to pay for the service. Their companies front end the bill. So my business grew a lot this year because of that. So so it's women is the is the primary target audience. Absolutely. Okay. So so then, I guess the the, the first question that comes to my mind. Because I had a I had a speaking coach on my show. You should listen to she's phenomenal, Tricia. Uh, yep. she, she was coaching one of my good friends and got her into TEDx. Uh, I think I think her coaching is different than what you do. It's very sure, different, right? Um, it's for people that want to be professional public speakers, not people that want to improve their presentation skills. But uh, I mean, if we if if we sit down over I don't drink, so whatever. Me buy, neither, actually. So it's water buy, for both of us. Coke, whatever, or water. And and you said to me, look, you're you're like my father figure. I'm thinking of leaving IBM and starting this coaching thing. And I think I think women are gonna love me. I would have looked at you and said, Brendan, snap out of it, dude. You're not a woman. Women, <laughs> like, women like to be coached by women. So that's what you, you think. Well, so how'd you overcome that one? It was very little. There, it, that's actually the wrong word. There was nothing to overcome, Zef. You know what ended up happening is, and, and Trisha does great work, by the way. She's awesome. I know a lot of people work with her. She's great. Definitely very different than what I do. But what happened was women actually really wanted to work with me. You know why? Because I think in retrospect, and I'm still figuring out why that is. Maybe I just got lucky. But I think there's two parts. One is I was really good at balancing the truth of how men perceive them while holding them in their power. So for example, if you're if you're a VP at a company, and you know this, right? So I'm mostly just saying this yeah. for the audience. When you're a VP at a tech company and you're a woman, you're in the vast minority of people. So there's a saying in the corporate world, which is men get promoted on potential, women get promoted on performance. So men, it's more like, oh, you know, I think, you know, he reminds me of me when I was younger. I should promote him. Women are not like that because there's not as many reference points. So even if the woman is like, infinitely more talented than the male counterpart. And that's actually one of my theses is that I, I'm not I'm not sure is going to be right, but it's what I'm betting on. I think women are going to dominate the C-suite in my in my lifetime because they're out graduating men two to one and they're a lot smarter in nature and more mature. But anyways, going based on this theory, but going back to this point, they feel a lot more insecurity around performing. Mm -hmm. Right. So when they meet a guy who can show them the way, but also balance that by saying you're a lot more powerful than you think, they appreciate it. But I think the real reason, that's kind of the explanation, the educate, but I don't know 100%. But I think the last piece, which I think is the most important one, is almost all the women I work with, not all of them, but I would say the vast majority are always a referral. So because women have a lot more emotional touch points with their counterparts than men do, Quick example, think about all your male best friends. When was the last time you talked to them? Some cases for me, six months ago, never talked to them, but we're friends. Women talk to each other all the time. So what happens? I worked with one specific client and I got her great results. I got lucky with her, very simple. I was on Clubhouse, got relief, well-known on Clubhouse. She wanted to work with me, got lucky. Then when I got her the result, which I'm pretty consistent in, she introduced me to all of her girlfriends. And she said, Brendan is the guy that I worked with. And that recommendation is what grew my women client base, which then created this exponential, not exponential fully, but definitely linear effect in the business. So I, I think you hit on, on again, it's, it's to me, it's everything's about the psychology of human behavior, because that's my 
that's my thing uh you brought up an interesting point as as a male you have a better perception of your client as a woman than another woman right you don't come in with that biased views or what you think it is I, but my theory is why you are successful and you'll continue to be successful because there's other male speaking coaches out there i know one of them in new york city he's pretty pretty flamboyant he's very you know whatever but uh, and and i'm assuming you, you don't sound impressed with him it's no, I, no look he's, he's he's okay um but one I, i i read you as a like a down-to-earth guy that just generally wants to share and help people but more than that i think because you don't look like a corporate guy you don't represent a threat to the women you're coaching because if you look like somebody they work with It's like PTSD. I don't want to be coached by this asshole that I meet on the boardroom who's obnoxious and always tests me, right? So they're much more relaxed with you, which which allows you to get through and truly coach them. Because coaching is really about the ability to intimately connect with your client. It's not about giving them homework. And that's why, that's why a lot of business coaches, from my perspective, are broke. Because they get into it for the wrong reason. They think that, oh, I'm going to coach you for one hour a week and I'm going to charge you three, four thousand dollars a month. And if I can get three or four of these a day, I'm going to make a lot of money. And initially, maybe it worked for them, but people are not stupid. And within a couple of months, the client says, well, I kind of like talking to him, but I'm not getting any, anything out of it. When, there's no value there, right? So you're not, you're not in the tangible coaching world where I'm going to make you better you're actually in a practical you you offer tangible value you're going to be better at speaking at presenting and how would she know that she's better simple people will come to her after a presentation say wow that was amazing right that's all you that's all they really need um yeah so I was going to I was going to say that that I came across in in building my business in New York City and doing networking which I absolutely hated uh and and then I publish a book and then and then they everybody came to me like flies you know oh let me help you promote your book and I'm going to get you on a speaking tour and I said that sounds great and how much is it well it's starting at $12,000 and I said are you out of your mind <laughs> I mean it's like don't you want to be a speaker you have a book you can go speak see to me that's the you know the the commodity people that just just latch on to you and they think that if they paint like a beautiful rosy picture of me on stage with 400 people in Vegas half of them are drunk half of them are can't wait to go to the slot machines and I'm going to get paid a couple thousand dollars plus airfare and it's going to make my day no and I'm not spending 12 grand doing it so that I, that's not really your competition because it's not about becoming a public speaker professional which by the way I would love to do that I would because I would love to meet different people and and I'm an educator right I'm a teacher that's my thing but I I would never go and and invest in somebody who's going to, and and I I've tried it with somebody I bartered with someone um, I would be a business coach and do marketing and I would get this kind of thing and it was I was just it was purposely stretched over a very long period of time and I'm impatient so it's just can can we shrink it can we do this quicker um so what's the what's your most practical message for someone who recognizes it that they're not good in the way they present they're not generally a good speaker which by the way is you more than the average person in the universe they're just they're they're publicly they're absolutely frightened and petrified of public speaking and to me public speaking could be in in a conference room speaking under five people some people just hate the fact that they have to stand up in front of x amount of people uh what's the what's the most practical advice you can give someone who wants to be a better speaker one tip that they can implement right away that will make a difference for sure is that other than so, getting a coach named Brenda of course story <laughs> for so for me the tip is if you communicate 20 better than your competition you'll stand out 100 of the time so it's a reminder for us 
that you don't have to do a lot to differentiate yourself. You just have to do the right things. So we talked about one of them, and I'll just uh, I'll give you two tips How about that. So one of them is the random word exercise, which is the first ball. The other two balls are the question drill and video messages. So question drills just mean we get asked questions all the time in our life. So I wasn't this versatile in a podcast before. Like when I started guesting, I sucked. I didn't know what kind of questions were going to be thrown at me. And I didn't know the answer to a lot of them. So how did I fix that? Every single day for five minutes, Seb, when I was probably three years ago, I would write down one question that I thought the world would ask you about my expertise. And I just answered it every day for five minutes. But if you do that for a year, you'll have answered 365 questions about your industry, about your business, about your expertise, you'll be bulletproof, or as bulletproof as it gets, minus people in New York City, but any, any, other, any other city, if people ask you about your life or your expertise, you'll be, you'll be just fine. And the other two tips is the random word exercise we talked about. And the third one is video messages. It's so simple, nobody does it so. And it's not about being flamboyant with this. It's just about saying, how can we love and appreciate our clients, the people that we serve, the people around us in a way that nobody else does in their life? So what did I do last December? I put a stupid Santa hat on during the holidays, bought it off Amazon for $7 or something. And I opened a list of my top 75 clients and I just sent 75 video messages, wishing them all personalized happy holidays. And guess what? I got three clients from doing that. It makes you money and it also makes people's days. That's really the magic of doing this. So always ask yourself, not do I know this, but am I implementing this? So this this video messaging, is brilliant and i came across uh loom which is i guess one company that does it maybe a couple of years ago and i thought it was one of the most brilliant platforms i've ever come across because instead of sending stupid emails that can be easily misinterpreted or never you'll never get the email um just record a personalized message it's you right it's so powerful and in one of my clients, I was I was teaching one of the directors to say if you as as we're working to increase your engagement with key decision makers within her community, their community, said instead of stand, sending stupid emails with PDF attachments of everything you do, just send a note, uh, just a video note. And the beauty is they give you the analytics that you can actually see who opened the video, and so you could see they received it, and sometimes. They actually reply, and, and in, I'm I'm really amazed that not many people use it. Right? It's it's really rare for me to get a loom video from someone, and you just said why? Exactly. It, it's not expensive. It's easy, and you don't have to put makeup on. You just be yourself. Just say, "Hey, Brendan, great to hear from you." That that was brilliant. It's amazing. So um, I want to do the random test exercise with you and give you a random two For words sure. and side note can we end on this stuff because i gotta drop in two minutes yes you know what so we'll skip we'll skip the random test not a problem sure. okay cool. um this was great i don't want i don't want to keep you I, I think i've got way more than than i have a right to get from you we're very open <laughs> and very very transparent and sharing um, I will include where to contact you, where to find you in my show notes, even though I don't do show notes as in the transcribe the thing. I want you to listen and not read, but there'll be enough information by you. Thank you again for taking the time. You're, you're really awesome. And hopefully this is the uh, start of a beautiful friendship. Absolutely, Zeb. I love, I love this interview. Thanks so and much. And by the way, me. you don't have this, this Canadian accent. I don't. Oh, the out, the out, the out. I haven't detected one out in this whole conversation. It's amazing. It's maybe a different. in Canada. Maybe it's a different side of Canada that I'm not familiar with. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever it is. All right. Thanks again, Brandon. Thanks, Seth. Great pleasure.